Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to your own Silicon Valley Tech Talks channel. This is your host Faisal Vattu from Menlo Park, California. I'm here at Meta campus today. As many of you know, Meta is at the forefront of AI innovation. Meta has made their Llama Gen AI model open source, which has really unleashed the potential of AI globally. Meta has also been building AI infrastructure and data centers. These data centers are required to train the AI models and run inference on them. Without these data centers, we cannot build AI models and use them. In today's show, we're going to talk to Meta's Vice President of Infrastructure, Dan Rabinovich, and learn about the innovations happening in data centers domain, especially after the advent of AI. Dan has 30 plus years of experience in big companies like Silicon Labs, NXP, Atheros, Qualcomm, Ruckus Networks, and now Meta. Without any further delay, let's go and talk to Dan and learn from his insights. Hello, Dan. Hi, Welcome Tato. to our show. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having me on today. Cool. Thank you. So, Dan, uh, Meta is uh, investing quite a bit in building AI data centers and infrastructures. How would these uh, AI-focused data centers be different from traditional data centers? That's a good question. Today, we are actually using our traditional data centers to build large training clusters for AI. But as we go forward, we're evolving the nature of those data centers. So the next generation will be all facility liquid cooling, for example. And then when we look out into the far future, we're building for very, very large scale, which means we have to reimagine the power and cooling and network design so that all of those things can scale to much bigger uh, topologies than we expected uh, when we first started designing data centers hmm. many years ago. Hmm. So uh, diving a little bit deeper, which aspects of data center engineering do you think would need to be revamped because of AI? Uh, it's a really interesting question. Um, so when we look at the, the way that AI systems are evolving, we're, we went from kind of like a general compute network and storage rack of like 30 kilowatts, we're already seeing rack designs where that thermal density is increasing well over, you know, um, 150 kilowatts, going to over 200, going to over 500. We can even see, you know, rack designs where the thermal density, you know, that thermal design point is, is up at like 700 kilowatts. So the densification of power also is creating uh, a lot of emphasis on liquid cooling as opposed to air cooling, because when you have a building, you can only design for so much airflow to, to provide that cooling, so many fans, et cetera. So there's a, you know, the interesting thing about data center engineering is it's a bunch of different disciplines that have to come together for electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, thermal engineering, and uh, you know, even looking at construction methodologies to be able to go faster, and an emphasis on renewable. So there's just pretty much like every aspect of design is now entering into these, uh, these massive scale data centers. Multiple big companies have started their own initiatives to build AI accelerators. Meta has announced Meta Training and Inference Accelerator, MTIA, for the same purpose. Yeah. Can you share a bit more rationale on what is the need of doing these in-house semiconductor products while we have big companies like NVIDIA, AMD providing the uh, AI GPUs to the industry? This is a really good question. So I think the, um, first of all, we are very lucky to have great suppliers in the merchant market and uh, the competition is actually very healthy. So, uh, you know, I, I think Meta actually is, uh, a beneficiary of that innovation that's coming from merchant market semiconductor companies. The reason why uh, you know Meta and other companies might want to invest on on their own to build AI accelerators is really, I think, kind of coming from two or three places. One, um, the obvious owner economics, right? There is a there's an economic and financial incentive for us if we can build something that's competitive and we can kind of share. Uh, some of the costs uh, to build these extremely large training clusters, for example, um, or just to, you know the the capacity that's required for for AI in general, having having some of that cost be lower just because we're building it ourselves, there's there's an advantage there. 
Um, but I don't think that's the principal motivation. At least I can't speak for our, our peer group in this in the hyperscaler world. But for us, Vessel, the other aspect of this is finding unique ways to deliver value for the workloads that we understand really well. So at the core, the first generation and the second generation of our training um, uh, and inference accelerators are really focused on our most critical ads, ranking, and recommendation workloads. That's really central to the company's business. And in many ways, what we've done is uh, because we are not a cloud service provider, we don't have to serve generic um, uh, kinds of uh, workloads to, to third parties. We can actually focus internally on what's most important to us and then optimize those solutions so they run much better, lower power, uh, better results, better performance. And so when you take all that into account, we like to think of that as like a performance per TCO dollar, the total cost of owning a solution benefit. For, for Meta by, by investing in that way. So I, th I really think this is like the, a critical uh, you know, opportunity for us to co-design solutions across the software and hardware world that are really targeting the workloads that, that we care about the most. And I'm sure you have seen many ups and downs of semiconductor industry in your 30 plus years career. At this stage, what are the key challenges semiconductor industry is facing and what key trends you are envisioning in the next five to 10 years? Um, I do think this is like one of the most fun, you know, one of the most fun and interesting times to be in the semiconductor industry. Um, and I, I think some really fundamental things have changed and it, it creates opportunities at the same time as it creates a lot of problems. So what's happened? Moore's law, uh, you know, people say Moore's law is dead, but let's let's say it's, uh, if it's not dead, it's on it's on um, it's on its last legs. You know, I think we're going to see some marginal gains from from generational you know shifts to new nodes, but really the the game now is shifted to package uh, technology, and I even hesitate to think of it as packaging because when you start to move to things like coos or silicon on wafer, silicon on panel, we're building systems. They're not traditional packaging technologies at all. And the complexity of 3D stacking of HBM and logic and, um, and analog mixed signal devices, there's just a whole bunch of, um, a whole bunch of challenges there. You're now basically having to do, uh, you, have to, you have to have your entire tool chain, your CAD design now basically uh, work across multiple chips, multiple wafers in some cases. So everything on the EDA side is, is changing how we get to improve power efficiency is really challenging because we don't have that instant gratification of a node shrink. So we have to engineer things in a very different way. I think some other challenges, well, very clearly like manufacturing capacity is a huge challenge. And as we shift to these new technologies, it's not like we can just say, I'll step and repeat what I did last time to build a bigger and better fab, now these fabs are actually doing very different kinds of work. And the cycle times are much longer on something like COAS than they would be on a traditional uh, silicon wafer. Um, and then I think a couple other changes that are really challenging. Yield is now a very different game. I think, you know, for anyone that's kind of building, um, I would say in the more conventional markets, things haven't changed that much, but again, for these big AI systems, big AI accelerator uh, um, chipsets, yield now is a much bigger problem to solve because you are literally, um, <laughs> you, you are aggregating so many different devices and it's not like you can just play the same uh, strategy that, you, that we've seen in memory where you just have redundancy and striping, uh, an extra you know, compute tile here or there to basically make up for, um, for yield loss with redundancy. Now your atomic unit of redundancy is very expensive and much bigger. Um, so yeah, I, I think those, that's probably like the, some of the big, big themes, all really interesting challenges. And I think the industry uh, has uh, a lot to look forward to in terms of problem solving. Uh, Dan, I'm sure many students, technologists, and new entrepreneurs are listening to you right now to our platform. Uh, what are the key innovation opportunities in uh, data centers engineering, which these folks can can work on for maximum impact? 
So, uh, look, I think, as it turns out, I, I do think that in addition to kind of the core skills around electrical engineering and, and you know, building these, these large systems, um, complex software development, uh, understanding how to build hyperscale fault tolerant systems in general, like all of those things are, are like vast and, and, uh, uh, and massive challenges. Um, Technology domains like mechanical and thermal are becoming very, very in demand uh, because those problems are prodigious. I think the other thing that uh, I'm really fascinated by is also the opportunity. You know, the United States, um, if, I, if I think about like the semiconductor industry, manufacturing moved overseas, we're starting to import that. We're also starting to see that, um, you know, really basic things like construction, we are we're getting back to like having massive construction projects, which these data center uh, projects represent. And so I do think there's actually places for um, skilled workers in you know site operations, construction that um, uh, represent a different kind of challenge compared to what we've seen in the past. So there's a lot going on there. Yeah. Uh, Dan, you had a quite amazing career. Uh, you had executive leadership roles at big companies. Do you have advice for young professionals who want to excel in large corporations? Uh, is there a recipe of success? Uh, I hesitate to say there's a recipe. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, th I think there's a few things that I found very helpful for me and I do think they can be helpful for, for lots of folks. You can get great training out of school at a big company. And a lot of times big companies will teach you core skills and help you navigate, um, you know, very uh, like a wide array of, of different um, engineering skills, management skills, understanding how to operate at larger scale. But there's a beauty also, um, and I found when I, I started my career at AMD, it was an amazing place to work. I learned so much during my time there. Uh, but my next three jobs were actually in startups where I had to get out of my comfort zone, do different kinds of jobs, uh, sweep the floor, figure out how to make stuff work that I never had to figure out before. And the scrappiness actually really, really benefited me. Um, I, I grew at a much faster clip by doing startups. And, um, and then going through, a, going through cycles where you put yourself in uncomfortable situations where you have to learn. And I think that's the, like, the thing that keeps me motivated is the continuous cycle of learning. I do think for people to grow their career, they have to get out of their comfort zone. And particularly now with the fast moving pace of, of AI, for example, adaptability and the ability to learn is more important than what your, deg your degree was or what you did in the last three years in your job. Because we will all be adapting and learning at a way faster clip because AI is now becoming part of the mainstream and things really are going to change a lot. So that flexibility is probably one of the, the most critical ingredients. Thank you very much, Dan. I'm sure the audience learned a lot from your insights. Vessel, thanks for, thanks for hosting me. Always a pleasure. Love working with you. Thank you. Cheers.